Islamic law. Please welcome Dr. Shah. I have uh, made this uh, title uh, for the presentation in this way, Finding Method in Their Madness. How our universities teach Islamic law. I have borrowed this phrase from Shakespeare, of course, method in his madness. And I will try to show that the way our universities teach Islamic law is real madness. And I will try to see if there is a method in this madness or not. So I will begin with the way our universities, the curricula, the syllabi, and the whole approach about Islamic law, how our universities look at Islamic law. What is Islamic law for our universities embodying legal education? Should we talk about Islamic law? because we are in the International Islamic University of Islamabad? Or should we talk about Muhammadan law? Or the Anglo-Muhammadan law? If we are talking about other universities. Because they equate Islamic law with the so-called Muhammadan law. Which is uh, our colonial baggage indeed. Sometimes they talk about Muslim personal law. Muslim personal law. Now, if it goes to the Roman law tradition, then there was law about acts, law about persons, law about property. How would you talk about Muslim personal law from the perspective of Islamic law students? Our Arab scholars, for example, have tried to coin a word, and our Arab friends indeed are having this habit of coining terms. So they would say, they would try to have a term for corporation, for example, calling it Sharikatul Musahama, and then we would feel as if the thing has been Islamized, or Islamicized. <coughs> Islamification of the Western concepts. So they have also tried to come up with a, another term for this thing and they call it the law of personal status, Qanunul Ahwal Shahsiyya. Now this is not just about uh, the title of the course or, or, uh, or the title of a particular subject. It actually denotes the whole approach about that particular area. And because of shortage of time, I will not go into too many details here, but I will just briefly tell you that the way these universities, including ours, and I will come back to our, our university just shortly, the way these universities look at Islamic law is actually based on our biases about Islamic law which we have inherited from our colonial masters. And these biases about Islamic law, these, these prejudices about Islamic law include, number one and foremost, when we talk about Islamic law, when we teach Islamic law, when we study Islamic law, we have in mind that it is a rigid law, out of tune with the realities of the time. Something which might be very <clears throat> beneficial in the past, no longer relevant today. Also, because of the works of the Orientalists, including uh, Joseph Shah, Fulson, and others, we believe, and sometimes we just copy without really thinking about it, 
that the Muslim jurists were talking about something which was never practiced even in Muslim history earlier and there was a gap between theory and practice. The law that was taught by Muslim jurists in the manuals of Islamic law which was recorded there was never practiced because the Muslim rulers had a non-religious secular system of administration of justice Sometimes they call it siyasa, siyasa shar'iyya. And then they say this was non-religious, non-legal, uh, secular system. And was it really so? And we take these prejudices with us when we study Islamic law and when we teach Islamic law. And another third important prejudice or misconception about Islamic law is that Islamic law Although we know there have been many schools of Islamic law, but we teach Islamic law as if there is just one common legal theory behind this uh, law, behind these various schools. One common legal theory which, uh, in which these various jurists differ only in details. Sometimes they call it the common legal theory, sometimes they call it the classical legal theory. This is not the case. In fact, every school of law represents an internally coherent and comprehensive and consistent legal theory. They are systems of interpretation and they must be understood as such and they must be taught as such. Approaches towards Islamic law systems of interpretation about Islamic law. But no, take any textbook which is taught about Islamic law in any school of law in Pakistan and you will see Muslim sects. As if these schools of law represent sects. And we have uh, some aversion about the term sect. So we develop that aversion from the very beginning when we talk about Islamic law and the schools of law. We do not have that kind of aversion when we talk about natural law, tradition, positivism, utilitarianism, legal realism, and so many other approaches about law. But when it comes to Islamic law and schools of Islamic law, because we have been taught that they are sects, so we have a kind of aversion towards them. And it is on uh, that basis and in that background that people raise then questions, who's Sharia? Well, they never raise this question, who's constitution? Take the American constitutional interpretation, for example. Is there one monolithic approach about interpreting the American constitution? Or take the Pakistani constitution. Do our judges have just one common theory about constitutional interpretation? Yesterday Munir Sahib was talking about Cornelius' uh, naturalism and Munir's positivism. And look at the, ju the various judgments of the Supreme Court even today and you will find many approaches and different legal theories but nobody asks whose constitution because we know that the Constitution, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, is what we mean here. And if the judges of the Supreme Court differ with each other, then the majority, uh, their decision is enforced. Irrespective of whether I agree with the conclusion or not, irrespective of whether I agree with the approach or not, irrespective of whether I like it or dislike it, it is enforced. I try to change it, I criticize it, but I never ask this question, whose Sharia or whose constitution? One more thing and then I switch over to the next part of my presentation. Our universities, most of them, teach Islamic law as just a law. Among so many other laws. While this should not be the case in Pakistan. 
Pakistan is an Islamic state. Islamic Republic of Pakistan, Article 1 of the Constitution. Islam is the state religion, Article 2 of the Constitution. Sovereignty belongs to Almighty Allah over the entire universe, Article 2a of the Constitution. Democracy, human rights, etc., 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 as enunciated by Islam. Article 227, no law shall be made repugnant to Islamic injunctions. All the existing laws shall be brought into conformity with the Islamic injunctions. Section 4, enforcement of the Sharia Act 1991, never abrogated, still exists. It is a binding law. It uses the word shall for all courts, that they shall interpret the law as per the Islamic injunctions. And this general obligation has been reiterated in many specific pieces of legislation as well, such as Section 338F of the Constitution of the Pakistan Penal Code and many other laws that they should, shall be interpreted as per Islamic injunctions. Now, how the judges can interpret these uh, laws as per the Islamic injunctions if they have not been trained? in this system of interpretation or systems of interpretation. So this is my first and foremost thesis here that it is the duty of all schools of law in Pakistan to teach Islamic law not as a law but as the law of the land. <laughs> now coming to after this constitutional and legal obligation coming to the madness in the way Islamic law is taught. Not only taught, look at the various decisions of the Supreme Court of Pakistan or the High Courts or even the Federal Sharia Court or the Council of Islamic Ideology and try to find out if the court or the council, for example, has a legal theory or just picking and choosing without going for the legal principles behind these various opinions. Unless we talk about those principles and we just do this cherry picking, uh, we cannot solve our problems here. And I have already written on this so I will not go into details here. If you are interested, I have written an article on this which is in the Lund's Law Journal in which I try to see if the Council of Islamic Ideology has a legal theory and I have given it the title Discovering Law Without a Coherent Legal Theory. This is madness. So, Coming to Islamic University and uh, let us do some soul searching here as well. The very first problem I see in the way Islamic law is being taught in the International Islamic University Islamabad is that we have bifurcated law and Sharia, which is sometimes very good for the purpose of specialization. So you have the law of contract, and then you have another special course about Islamic law of contract. You have partnerships law, and then you have Islamic law of partnerships. Seems good enough. But the bifurcation is lethal. Because as I said, even if we have the Contract Act of 1872, but after the 1973 Constitution, after the Objections Resolution, then after the 1973 Constitution, and then particularly after Article 2A has been inserted and Article 227 of the Constitution, and then Section 4 of the 1991 Muslim Personal Law, uh, 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 Section 4 of the 1991 Enforcement of Sharia Act and many other laws. Now all these laws must be interpreted from the perspective of Islamic law. Just see how the Supreme Court of Pakistan defined Muslim personal law in Musamat Farishta versus the Federation of Pakistan uh, in 1981. And then also see how the same Supreme Court redefined Muslim personal law in Dr. Mahmoud Rahman Faisal versus Government of Pakistan 1994 just because a phrase was added to Article 227 of the Constitution 
after Parishta case. So that phrase changed the meaning of the phrase Muslim personal law in constitution. So 1872 contract act remains there, but after we have Islamized the system, and now we have Islamic constitution, Islamic state, and Islamic laws here, and all laws shall be interpreted in the light of Islamic injunctions, now their text changes its color and flavor and meaning. So something should be done about this, how our students should try to reinterpret the law of contract, for example, or the law of partnerships or any other law for that matter, from the perspective of Islamic law. I also see problems with the way sometimes we have courses about legal study of Quran on the one hand, legal study of the Sunnah on the other hand, because in my view and in the view of all jurists of all schools of Islamic law, there is no bifurcation between Quran and the Sunnah. They go hand in hand. The Quran can never be understood in isolation from the Sunnah of the Prophet And we, then we have problems with, for example, riba of the Quran, riba of the Sunnah, etc. Now what needs to be done, I have talked a lot about problems as I said yesterday, I will be talking about problems. What needs to be done, yes somebody said about textbooks and another person answered that we have so many textbooks already there about this law, that law. True, we have so many textbooks, but as I said they have been written not in the Pakistani context, not from the perspective of the Islamic injunctions. When you, have, when you you wear these glasses and you look at the same law, you have to rewrite many things. So there is indeed a need of textbooks about various laws, how these various laws should be taught and should be interpreted from the perspective of Islamic law. And yes, we need a teacher's training as well. We need to focus on teaching methods as well. And in particular, I should refer to an incident once uh, Professor Niazi, my mentor and very beloved teacher, uh, came out of uh, his class and he told me, Mushtaq, I just taught the Musul al fiqh from Borden High Muslim students. Musul al fiqh from Borden High jurisprudence. Yes, we need that kind of approach somehow. Because Islamic law is not just a matter of sawab, it is a matter of sawab indeed, but it is a law. It should be taught like a law. Legal reasoning and legal approach has to be there. And in particular, I should uh, recommend all of you to read and search about case method. How case method is used in teaching law across the globe today. And this is a method in which our jurists actually excelled. Centuries ago, Roscoe Pound, a very renowned jurist, talking about the Hidayah, says this is the beginning of the case method. Because he didn't know that the Hidayah was written in the 6th century after Hijra, and there were 5 centuries even before the Hidayah where our jurists, even in that era, had already mastered case method. See, for example, the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ about riba, al-zahab, bi-zahab, mislam, bi-mislam, yadam, bi sawa'am, bi-sawa. Now, see how the jurists interpret this tradition. And they would say, if 100 dinars of gold are exchanged for 100 dinars of gold, Okay, if there are 110 dinars on the other side, this is the other end. Now this is the very basic case. 100 dinars on the one hand, 10 dinars on the other. Then they say, okay, if there are 100 dinars and 110 dirhams made of silver, then they say, okay, the Prophet allowed this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then they say, okay, if there are 100 dinars and 110 dirhams on the one hand, and 110 dinars and 100 dirhams on the other. Is it permissible? <laughs> and then they further add to this. Many people say, uh, feel problem with this. Why so much of hair splitting? 
And let me tell you, this is the only way to teach law. Just talking about abstract principles is not enough and is not going to serve the purpose. You teach principles through cases. You give a set of facts, then you give another set of facts, you try to distinguish the cases, you show the principle. You relate various sets of facts under a broader principle. This needs a lot of effort from uh, the teacher, of course, but it is the only way. Last year I was in Geneva uh, for International Humanitarian Law Workshop. 30, more than 30 experts around the globe, they, uh, uh, from various universities, they came there to Geneva. And we were talking about the various uh, problems about Islamic law and international humanitarian law. In that workshop, and two years ago as well, in another workshop, we are experts of international humanitarian law, teaching international humanitarian law in different universities across the globe, they gathered. And in both these workshops, we agreed that the most efficient way of teaching international humanitarian law is through case method. And the same is true about Islamic law. I will just uh, share a joke with you. Okay, this has been too much now. So, kaha jata hai, aur ye joke urdu mein hi acha lagta hai. Aaj kal meri, yani ye hoti hai, आदत रात को सोने से पहले और पता नहीं किसको अच्छा लगे या बुरा मैं रात को सोने से पहले आजकल तलमूद पढ़ रहा हूँ जूविश लॉ का तो उसमें भी बड़ी दिलचस्प चीजें मिल जाती हैं हाउ द जूविश जूरिस्ट लुक्ड एट द लॉ द तोरा एंड हाउ द इंटरप्रेटेड इट बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग पैरेलल्स मिलते हैं इस्लामिक लॉ के साथ अच्छा और एक किताब अजीज साहब हमारे साथ हैं हम गए थे अमेरिका में तो वहाँ एक किताब मुझे ये क्या है वो ओल्ड बुक शॉप में मिली थी अबाउट जूविश फोक स्टोरीज तो उसमें ये कहानी मुझे मिली कि एक रोमन जो अपने रोमन लॉ का बड़ा जाहिर मदार था और जूविश लॉ में जाहिर बहुत ज्यादा तरकीब भी लोग किया करते थे क्या आप एक एक चीज में निकालते यूं हो तो क्या होगा यूं हो तो क्या अगर फिर यूं हो तो फिर क्या हो जाएगा लॉयर्स तो वो आया एक रोमन कहते हैं कि एक यहूदी रबाई के पास और उससे पूछा कि मैं आपका लॉ समझना चाहता हूं आपके साथ पढ़ना चाहता हूं आप मुझे स्टूडेंट के तौर पर एडमिट करें तो गया एंट्रेंस टेस्ट उसका लिया जा रहा था उन्होंने कहा आप नहीं पढ़ सकते आप इसके लिए जो रिक्वायर्ड स्किल है वो आपके पास नहीं है तो आप टेस्ट ले लीजिए तो उन्होंने कहा अच्छा ठीक है मैं आपके सामने एक सवाल रखता हूं दो बंदे एक आतशदान में से नीचे उतरे एक का मुंह काला हुआ दूसरे का नहीं तो मुंह कौन धोएगा अच्छा जिन्होंने ये लतीफा मुझसे सुना हो ना वो भी अजराय करम हंस लिया कीजिए क्योंकि क्योंकि जिन्होंने नहीं सुना ना वो हंसेंगे तो आपका फायदा इसी में है तो उन्हें कहा कि दो बंदे एक आतशदान में से उतरे तो एक का मुंह काला हुआ दूसरे का नहीं हुआ कौन मुंह धोएगा तो उसने स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड लेव एन का जो एक्सटेंड कोर्ट जवाब होता है ना वही किसका मुंह काला हुआ है वो धोए गए उसने कहा यू आर नॉट फिट टू बी अ लॉयर क्यों इसलिए कि वो जब दूसरे बंदे को देखेगा तो समझेगा मेरा मुंह साफ है जिसका मुंह साफ है वो इसे देखेगा तो समझेगा मेरा मुंह काला है तो वो धोएगा अभी कहानी जारी है तो चले ठीक है मैंने इसे दिल से नहीं सोचा था तो आप मुझे कोई और सवाल नहीं उन्होंने कहा अच्छा ठीक है दो बंदे एक आतिशदान में से उतरे एक का मुंह काला हुआ दूसरे का नहीं हुआ कौन मुंह धोएगा अब उसने तो जवाब रख लिया था उसने कहा कि जिसका मुंह साफ है वो दूसरे को देखेगा तो समझेगा कि मेरा मुंह काला हुआ है तो वो धो दे उसने कहा तुम फिर पेट हो गया हो क्योंकि वहां आई ना भी है उसमें देख लेंगे तो जिसका मुंह साफ है वो चला जाएगा जिसका नहीं साफ हो धोएगा तो हाँ मैंने तो पूछा ही नहीं था कि वहां आईना है या नहीं है तो चले आईना मैं सोचूंगा कोई और सवाल कीजिए तो एक अच्छा ठीक है दो बंदे एक आतिशदान में से हो गए एक का मुंह साफ रहा दूसरे का काला हुआ कौन मुंह धोएगा तो उसने कहा दोनों तो वो चाहेगा जिसका मुंह साफ है लेकिन आईने में देख के वो समझ जाएगा तो जिसका मुंह काला है वही धोएगा तो उसने कहा तुम फिर फेर हो गए हो 
क्यों भाई तुमने ये सोचा ही नहीं कि दो बंदे एक का खजदान में से उतरे ये कैसे हो सकता है कि एक का मुंह काला हो दूसरे का साफ हो कहानी अभी जा रही है ये केस मेथड है अच्छा मैं फिर पूछा तो पूछा ठीक है दो बंदे या खजदान में से उतरे एक का मुंह साफ दूसरे का नहीं कौन दूरेगा देखा ये कैसे मुमकिन है कि दो बंदे उतरे और एक का मुंह साफ रहे दूसरे का जो भी शराबाई ने जवाब दिया क्यों नहीं पॉसिबल भाई एक बंदा जब नीचे उतर रहा था सारी कारक साथ ले लिया दूसरा उतरा तो साफ सुथरा हूं अच्छा अब वो बेचारा हैरान कि मैं ये कहूं तो जवाब में वो ये कहते हैं ये कहूं तो जवाब में वो कहते हैं तो कहा ठीक है मैंने नहीं सीखना लाओ वगैरह लेकिन मुझे बता दो दें कि मुंह कौन धोएगा तो उसने कहा कि कोई भी नहीं हुए क्यों आराम हो पानी ही नहीं है पानी मुंह धोने का सवाल तो सब पैदा होगा जब पानी हो ना इन्होंने सबसे बुनियादी सवाल की नहीं नहीं अच्छा ये देखिए एक ही इशू को देखने के कितने जाविए हो सकते हैं कौन कौन से फैक्टर्स हो सकते हैं आखिरी बात एक यहूदी रबाई ही की कहानी है इसी तरह एक रोमन उसके पास आया और उसने उससे कहा कि मैं आपके साथ सब कुछ मानने के लिए तैयार हूं बस मुझे सिर्फ इतना कीजिए कि एक टांग पर खड़े होकर अपनी पूरी शरीयत मुझे बताइए यहूदी शरीयत इतनी तफसीली एक टांग पर खड़े होकर कैसे सुनाए बड़ा मशहूर यहूदी रवायत गुजरा है हिलिन और इसकी जो आगे मैं बात बता रहा इसको हिलन गोल्डन लॉ कहते हैं फिलिल ने कहा एक टांग पर खड़े होकर कि जो तुम नहीं चाहते कि तुम्हारे साथ हो वो दूसरों के साथ ना करो कहा ये तो रात है बाकी तो सीला दिस इज द वे लॉ इज टॉप कैसे आप पीस एंड बिट्स में डिवाइड करते हैं ये अलग स्किल है और कैसे मुख्तलिफ रूल्स को एक प्रिंसिपल के तहत लाते हैं और ये बात बाइबल में यानी ये जो यहूदी रवाई की बात है ये मसीह इस्लाम से भी रिवायत हुई है वास्पल्स में मौजूद है और रसूल सल्लाम की हदीस भी इस मकूम के हवाले से मौजूद है तो आई थैंक यू वेरी मच